In this lecture, we'll cover the descending motor pathways in the spinal cord. First, we'll go through the corticospinal tract, which connects upper motor neurons with lower motor neurons. Then, we'll go through the local circuitry of the spinal cord that helps regulate motor output. Those will be our spinal pattern generators. And then, finally, we'll touch on non-conscious descending pathways that help influence motor output without us having to think about it. So the corticospinal tract is the projection from the layer 5 upper motor neurons in the cortex down to the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord. The upper motor neurons you should think of as being organized around movements, not muscles, while the lower motor neurons are mapped to individual muscle fibers. So we have a map. Uh, we have both a motor and sensory map in the cortex. The neurons in the cortex have a similar spatial relationship to the motor and sensory neurons out there in the periphery. So sensory neurons that innervate different digits and thus have axons near one another project to parts of the sensory cortex that are also near one another. And that's what creates the maps you can see on this slide here. Blue showing you the primary somatosensory cortex. So the ventral posterolateral thalamus projects there in an organized fashion to create that orderly arrangement. The motor cortex is shown on the right. That's the red strip of cortex there. And you'll notice it looks quite similar to the sensory cortex. You might notice that it doesn't quite look a, as, as similar to our body as you might expect. For example, the lips and hands are overly represented on our motor and sensory maps. Because our lips are quite sensitive to sensory input, we also need to have very fine control over the lips and tongue so that we can communicate. And of course we do a lot of nifty things with our hands. So we devote a lot of cortex thus to the sensation and motor control of certain aspects of our body and not others. The trunk, for example, is sort of sparsely represented in the cortex because we don't do a whole lot with it other than remain upright, maybe bend a little, but we don't go feeling around in the environment with it, we don't write our names with it. And you can see the relative size of the cortical representation then put onto a body in the lower left images there, the homunculi, which just, homunculus just means little man. There's a sensory homunculus and a motor homunculus, and you'll notice in both cases the hands lips and tongue are much larger than we actually have on our body. And that's just to say we devote a lot of cortex to those parts of our body. Now the upper motor neurons found in layer 5 of the cortex, um, while they do have this kind of rough organization around body parts, uh, I don't want you to think of them as controlling muscles because they don't. They control lower motor neurons. And in fact what we find is that upper motor neurons will converge on the same lower motor neurons. So let's have a look at this slide here. On the left you can see the rough motor map of the upper limb. Now there are distal portions of the upper limb that's um, located in yellow on this map. There's the distal the proximal region that would be green and then there's proximal portions of the upper limb shown in blue. So you'll notice it's not quite as clean as what we just saw on the last slide. That's a little too good to be true. In reality, the map is a little more chaotic. You'll notice that the distal portions are wrapping around the proximal portions of the upper limb. If we have a look in the middle and right hand portion of this illustration, this is showing us um, the stimulation of the cortex, and which parts related to movement at the shoulder or the wrist, those are on top, compared to muscles that are in the shoulder and that control the wrist, those are on the bottom. So let's look in the middle. Shoulder rotation. Fairly clean motor map here. Mostly we're in that blue, maybe a little bit of the green region of the motor cortex, but there's far fewer neurons in the motor cortex that relate to shoulder rotation then map to the deltoid 
The deltoid is one of the major muscles of the shoulder, but there are other muscles that work together to move the shoulder. Notice that a far greater number of upper motor neurons are excited in order to lead to deltoid activity. So the map for the shoulder is cleaner than that of the deltoid. This is because we use the deltoid muscle not only when we're moving our shoulder, but also when we're moving other parts of the arm. The deltoid is going to help stabilize the shoulder in case we're trying to pull backward with our wrist or flex at the elbow. Those movements in other parts of the arm, more proximal distal or just distal, those movements are also going to involve the deltoid, but maybe more for stabilizing purposes. And that's why the deltoid map is far messier on the bottom there than the shoulder map. So upper motor neurons are organized around the movement of body parts, not muscles. Muscle organization is for lower motor neurons. Lower motor neurons map to specific muscles, but upper motor neurons project to multiple lower motor neurons so that we can move a specific part of our body using a variety of muscles. So here we're seeing the convergence of upper motor neurons. In order to move the deltoid, Many upper motor neurons can help accomplish that. Same thing for the extensor carpi radialis. So if we want to extend at the wrist, this is one of the muscles that will help with that. If we just think about movement at the wrist, that's the map on the top right there. That map is cleaner than the bottom right. The extensor carpi radialis is um, activated by upper motor neurons that control not only distal movements of the upper limb that is in the in the yellow but also proximal you'll notice we are finding more blue neurons being active so the heights of those peaks is just showing you about how easy is it um, for these neurons to stimulate either movement of that body part or contraction of that individual muscle now upper motor neurons also diverge so not only do multiple upper motor neurons control the same lower motor neurons, one upper motor neuron can control multiple lower motor neurons. Because again, upper motor neurons don't care about muscles. They care about moving specific body parts. And if I want to pull backward, if I want to bring my hand closer to my body, there are several muscles that are going to be involved in this movement. So I'm going to need to control many lower motor neurons and the same lower motor neuron, that is the same muscle, can be involved in multiple movements. So, this is all to say, when we're thinking of the cortex, we're thinking of moving our body, not individual muscles. And that's probably how you imagine moving. I'm going to reach my hand out. You don't think of all the various muscles that are involved in, you know, flexion at the shoulder, extension at the elbow, extension at the wrist. No, you just think, I'm going to reach my arm forward. How you think is how your cortex is organized. The specific mapping to muscles is down in the spinal cord for lower motor neurons. Now that projection from upper motor neurons to lower motor neurons is the corticospinal tract. There's a few regions of the cortex that contribute to the corticospinal tract. We have, of course, the primary motor cortex. As the name suggests, this contains a whole lot of motor neurons they're going to project downward and control lower motor neurons. So the precentral gyrus, that's my primary motor cortex. I also have two additional areas. There's the premotor cortex and supplementary motor cortex. Something kind of like this, premotor cortex, supplementary motor uh, area. <clears throat> These are going to contribute to the corticospinal tract as well. So these will project downward. Again, these are my upper motor neurons organized around movements. Some deal more with, you know, uh, sensory input that's guiding movements. Others more internal input, remembered actions or something like that. And then we have our motor map on M1. These project downward to control lower motor neurons that then innervate individual muscles. And let the names work for you. Upper motor neurons are above lower motor neurons. The names make sense.
We can also target sensory interneurons with the corticospinal tract as well. Because not only do we have our motor cortices, we also have the primary somatosensory cortex contributing to these fibers in the corticospinal tract. Here, their target seems to be more in the dorsal horn, these kind of sensory relay neurons that allow feedback from sensory afferents to influence motor neurons. This can make us more sensitive to sensory input. For example, if we're feeling around in the dark for something. We don't care so much about vision, we care more about what we're feeling with our fingers. Where are my keys or where's my phone on the nightstand? This pathway can allow the sensory neurons to better stimulate lower motor neurons and guide their action in the absence of visual input. So the motor regions make a whole lot of sense, but don't forget the primary somatosensory cortex is also a part of the corticospinal tract. Now that corticospinal tract is going to go from layer 5 in the cortex down through the cortical white matter, through the brain stem, and down into the spinal cord. So we start in the cortex. Of course, we've got a thalamus here. There's some basal ganglia over there. But here in layer 5, these neurons, these big old pyramidal neurons, all project downward. This white matter tract is what we call the uh, corona radiata. Right? It's a radiating little crown of cortical white matter. So there's my corona radiata. My fiber bundle gets collected here in the internal capsule. The internal capsule runs between the thalamus and the basal ganglia. So corona radiata. Now we're at the internal capsule. At this point, once we are now dropping below the thalamus, now we're in the midbrain. So the midbrain, we're going to have those big old cerebral peduncles. Uh, that make up the midbrain here. So I'll we'll run down here. There's my cerebral peduncles. So those are going to sit on the front of the midbrain there. We'll head on through the pons. We'll kind of scatter around some pontine nuclei. Uh, as a matter of fact, most fibers are actually going to terminate in the pons. The cortical pontine tract is. Uh, oh, somewhere on the order of 20 times bigger than the cortical spinal tract, something like that. But we're going to pass on through here because we're not talking about that today. And then we'll get down into the medulla. Here's those pyramids, right? Those kind of two bulges at the front of the medulla. That's where my cortical spinal tract fibers are running. And then once we transition from medulla to spinal cord, Now we're going to have crossing of most of the fibers, at least the fibers in the lateral corticospinal tract, and then some remain ipsilateral. The ipsilateral tract here is going to be the anterior corticospinal tract, uncrossed, uh, and then the lateral corticospinal tract, that's a little L, crosses over. We're going to iterate the limbs or the axial muscles with the lateral or anterior corticospinal tract, respectively. When we head down into the spinal cord, here you can see the lateral corticospinal tract and the anterior corticospinal tract running in two different parts. And that allows them to target different aspects of the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, we have an organization in the anterior horn. In the anterior horn, uh, more, more distal muscles are going to be in more distal parts of the anterior horn, as the cartoon over there is showing you, while the more proximal trunk muscles are in the more medial aspects of that anterior horn. That puts them closer to the anterior corticospinal tract, which is why the anterior corticospinal tract innervates the trunk. And then the lateral corticospinal tract is much closer to the more lateral limb controlling lower motor neurons. So the lateral corticospinal tract controls the limbs. And here they've color-coded it for you nicely, red being the lateral corticospinal tract, innervating the red limb lower motor neurons, and the blue anterior corticospinal tract innervates the blue trunk lower motor neurons.
Of course, don't forget we have two types of lower motor neurons. We got alpha to control those extrafusal fibers. That's the big old bunch of meat that you can see over there. And then there's gamma lower motor neurons to control the intrafusal fibers at the muscle spindle. These lower motor neurons then innervate individual muscle fibers. Each lower motor neuron innervates a variable number of muscle fibers, and that number of muscle fibers would be called the motor unit of that lower motor neuron. So again, a motor unit is a single lower motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. Some uh, motor neurons innervate fairly few muscle fibers and thus have small motor units. They'll generate very little force. Others will innervate much larger motor units and thus create much greater force when that motor neuron is excited. Small motor units are very helpful for fine movements, while large motor units are very helpful for powerful movements. Now these motor units tend to be the same type of fiber. That's what's interesting about this. So the small motor neurons tend to innervate uh, a small number of slow twitch fibers, while large motor neurons tend to innervate a large number of fast twitch fibers. And we can see that fairly well represented in this cartoon over here. Don't forget the size principle from lecture 8. That size principle is going to allow us to recruit the small motor neurons and thus the weaker motor units first. And then with continual excitatory input, we can recruit the larger and stronger motor units so we get nice, smooth movements, nothing herky-jerky. Now there's an organization within the spinal cord, of course, from rostral to caudal. So the cervical spine is going to innervate the upper limb, thoracic gets the trunk, lumbar gets the anterior uh, leg, cer um, sacral gets the posterior leg. So there's an organization from top to bottom. In those areas where we innervate limbs, as you can see over here, the cervical uh, cord shown on top there has very large anterior horns. That's to accommodate a greater number of lower motor neurons because we have additional muscles to control. In the thoracic spine, you'll notice the anterior horns are much smaller. We only have that medial portion because we only have axial trunk muscles to control. No limbs for the thoracic spine there, other than a little you know, T1 in the brachial plexus. There's also an organization from medial to lateral, as already mentioned. So at each segment, we put the medial muscles in the middle of the spinal cord, and the lateral muscles are controlled by lower motor neurons in the lateral aspect of the spinal cord, just like that cartoon shows us. So anytime we want to have a movement, the cortical spinal tract stimulates both alpha and gamma lower motor neurons, and of course it stimulates gamma lower motor neurons first. It's the size principle. Gamma lower motor neurons are smaller, thus they are more excitable. V equals IR. So first we activate gamma lower motor neurons. Head down the right side of this cartoon. That stretches our spindle. Spindle afferents provide excitatory input to those alpha lower motor neurons. Of course, so does the cortical spinal tract, but that sensory feedback helps drive activation of alpha lower motor neurons, so we get muscle contraction. Those extrafusal fibers contract. As we contract, you might expect the spindle afferents to become less active. Not the case. Continued input from the cortical spinal tract drives continued output of gamma lower motor neurons. So take a look at the bottom part of this illustration. This is showing you the EMG that's recorded. So we're seeing an increase in muscle activity on top. That translates to a decrease in the finger angle because the muscles are contracting there. Below that, we see the 1A afferents, that is the spindle afferents. You'll notice that they actually become more active during muscle contraction. And that's because we always recruit gamma lower motor neurons. If we didn't recruit gamma lower motor neurons, then yes, muscle contraction would lead to a decrease in spindle feedback. That's what the top is showing us. What should be happening there is the contraction should be cut short 
we're going to lose one source of excitation, the spindle afferent, through contraction. That's not what happens in real life. We recruit both gamma and alpha lower motor neurons, and that's shown in the bottom. Those gamma lower motor neurons keep the spindle loaded. So while we contract, those spindle afferents provide additional excitation to alpha lower motor neurons. So the corticospinal tract is going to excite both alpha and gamma lower motor neurons. We're going to target a variety of lower motor neurons from each upper motor neuron. And lower motor neurons can be controlled by multiple different upper motor neurons. So we have both convergence and divergence going on in our corticospinal tract. Within the spinal cord, we've got a few inner neurons to consider. These inner neurons are going to talk to one another or lower motor neurons uh, in order to, uh, um, let's say, massage the input from the upper motor neurons and make sure that our motor output uh, matches what our planned action is and is in accord with sensory input as well. So those collections of inner neurons that are going to affect motor output are what we call central pattern generators. Anytime you hear central pattern generator, that just means a bunch of inner neurons that talk to each other and create some kind of output based on what kind of input they're getting. For example, the stretch reflex. Central pattern generators create that. So let's go through some of our inner neurons here. First we have our excitatory inner neurons. These things ensure that the corticospinal tract is able to activate lower motor neurons reliably. So here's the pathway here. Those green neurons over there are excitatory and they excite one another. Now this is most likely the target of the corticospinal tract in higher mammals like you and me. We excite these excitatory inner neurons. So let's say this neuron gets excited. It dumps some glutamate out here to excite this neuron. It'll dump some glutamate out here to excite this neuron again. And it'll dump glutamate out and excite this one again. And you'll notice what this is going to create is a burst of action potentials. Not only do they target one another, excitatory inner neurons also target lower motor neurons. So while they're bursting on one another, they're also bursting on lower motor neurons so that we get a burst of output. And that leads to robust muscle contraction. So input from the corticospinal tract gets translated into a burst of output from lower motor neurons. So we get reliable activation. Of course, we also have inhibitory inner neurons, not just the excitatory ones here. These inhibitory inner neurons are, are important for flexor extensor coupling. Let's say we have a flexor lower motor neuron and an extensor. These will, of course, hit muscles on different sides of a joint. magic of ink. We can pull on this in different ways. Okay, forgive this. Forgive me for my drawing there. But flexors, flexor lower motor neurons, are going to act on one muscle group while extensors will act on the other. So biceps versus triceps. Well, we usually don't want these two contract at the same time. Often we're trying to move at a joint. So that requires just a little bit of logic. And that's where my 1A inner neurons come in. These are a part of that stretch reflex. Don't forget that. That's how they get their name. So 1A afferents turn them on. Hey, so do corticospinal tracts. 
So if I'm an upper motor neuron who likes to cause elbow flexion, I have two targets. I'll project down and I'll stimulate my lower motor neurons, of course, by those excitatory inner neurons. Let me just leave that out so this is kind of clean. But I'll also stimulate this 1A inner neuron. What happens? I turn on the flexor and I turn off the extensor. So I get contraction and relaxation on different sides of the joint. So I get movement. One inner neuron is the simplest central pattern generator. Now these are also targeted by inhibitory neurons called Renshaw cells. That's the next one we're going to talk about. Renshaw cells, what if we want to stabilize the elbow? Let's say I'm an upper motor neuron. I'm not concerned with elbow flexion. No, instead I'm more concerned about stabilizing the elbow. So I want to have elbow stability. I don't want it to move. I actually want co-contraction on both sides of that joint. How can I do it? Well, I need to turn off these 1A inner neurons. So rather than targeting that, what I'll do is hit both of these and I'll hit this inhibitory Renshaw cell. Oh boy, what's going to happen now? Well, I'm still exciting the flexor and the extensor, and I'm going to make sure that any of that spindle feedback doesn't inhibit one or the other. I'm just showing you one circuit here. There's the same thing for flexors. Because remember, 1A afferents feed back onto these 1A inner neurons. So if I get any spindle activity over here, and I sure will because I'm causing contraction of the muscle, those gamma lower motor neurons are going to give me some spindle afferent activity that might excite this 1A afferent. There's my, I'm sorry, this 1A inner neuron. I don't want that to happen, so I have to turn this off, and that's where Renshaw cells come in. These will spit out a little glycine and make sure my 1A inner neurons don't get activated. So they don't inhibit the lower motor neuron, so both flexor and extensor will contract. And that will stabilize the elbow and prevent it from moving in case there's any bumps. <clears throat> the other thing that Renshaw cells do is filter out weak input. And this is always tricky for folks. But we'll see this everywhere. This is what we call lateral inhibition. Okay. So we draw these pathways and we're, we pretend like they're perfect one neuron to one neuron. That's not how it works. Okay, remember those upper motor neurons don't talk one to one to lower motor neurons. They've got these axon projections and most of them will go to a subset of lower motor neurons here. But axon projections are sloppy. So we actually get a little weak input to other lower motor neurons we really don't want to control. But we could if the upper motor neurons that strongly innervate them are, are lost. We got a backup plan. So sloppy axonal projections are the insurance plan of the central nervous system. We have options. We have some weak axons that are already over here. So in case I need to control this someday, I can. But I don't want to right now because I still have this in place. How can I make sure that this weak axon doesn't inadvertently stimulate this lower motor neuron over here when I'm trying to talk to these? That's where Renshaw cells come in. Not only do they get input from upper motor neurons, they also get input from lower motor neurons. So yes, we'll go talk to muscles. That's our job. But lower motor neurons also feed back onto Renshaw cells. And these provide just some local weak inhibition. So what happens? This lower motor neuron is active. It starts spitting out a little acetylcholine that stimulates the Renshaw cell to provide a little bit of inhibition. 
That little bit of inhibition is not going to be enough to overcome this excitation I get, of course, through excitatory interneurons. But the strong excitation from the corticospinal tract can easily overcome a little bit of weak inhibition. This weak axonal projection, my insurance plan, I don't cash in my insurance plan yet because that little bit of excitation is easily filtered out by that inhibition from Renshaw cells. So only these lower motor neurons with strong input are active. These, not so much. And that's what we can see in the cartoon that I've made for you over there. Two motor neurons. One is getting strongly activated, motor neuron one. Motor neuron one excites the Renshaw cell. You see the firing of the Renshaw cell. And that makes sure that motor neuron two stays quiet while motor neuron one is active. So it's a way of cleaning up sloppy axonal projections. We might want this someday. We don't know. So we don't get rid of it. The central nervous system kind of hoards weak axonal projections. We'll talk about these uh, again throughout the class. Now, of course, here we're just talking about the same side of the spinal cord. We also have inner neurons that cross and talk to the other side. And those are what we call commissural inner neurons. That just means they cross the midline. That's it. They get input from all the inner neurons that are part of the central pattern generators, and they just allow one side to be active or the other. Usually, with locomotion, for example, we're you know, flexing, uh, let's say, the, the right hip, but we're extending the left hip. So we don't want flexion on both sides. We want to alternate flexion, and we want to alternate extension, and that's where commissural inner neurons come in. We've got this reciprocal inhibition circuit shown over there. The commissural interneurons are the red ones. We got our green excitatory interneurons, our blue lower motor neurons, and then we got the red commissural interneurons. These cross the midline and inhibit everything. And this creates a winner take all circuit. For example, we get some bilateral input to say walk. Okay. We want both sides of our body to walk, but we want to coordinate extensor, flexor activity on both sides of the body. So only one side can be active at a time. In this example, the left is active, and because the left side is active, those commissural inner neurons inhibit the right side. Now this burst firing that goes on in our excitatory inner neurons eventually terminates we got calcium activated potassium channels. But that there's short-lived excitation. So eventually the commissural inner neurons are not as excited on the left. That decreases inhibition on the right, and that allows then the right side to be active. Of course, this will end and then we'll get the left side active again. So you get this alternating left, right, left, right. Because of reciprocal inhibition. We'll see this a lot, so get used to that circuit. If two things inhibit each other, only one can be active. And we can see this working over here. So the data on the right are showing you uh, recordings from a neonatal rat spinal cord. So if you just strip away all the unimportant parts of the rat, that is everything except the spinal cord in this case, and you record at a couple different spinal levels on both sides. So they got L2 on top, L3 on the bottom, right on top, left below that in both cases. I want you to notice there's a burst on the right, then there's a burst on the left, then there's a burst on the right, then there's a burst on the left. You get these alternating left-right movements. That is locomotion. Your left and your right side are doing opposite things. What allows them to do opposite things are commissural interneurons. So you get both sides coordinated without having to think about it. Let the spinal cord figure it out. Of course, these central pattern generators contribute to the reflexes that we've already gone over, such as the stretch reflex. What's going on there? Well, the input from muscle spindles, right? The, those 1A afferents then activate the agonist lower motor neuron, probably through excitatory interneurons, and they activate those 1A interneurons that inhibit the antagonist. Okay, so let's go ahead and tap. We'll stretch the agonist muscle there, right? That's going to cause 
it to contract. The antagonist will relax because of the 1A interneurons. Nothing new here. Here it is again, written out, and in case you're into that kind of thing. So the good old patellar reflex. The first thing we do, tap on the patellar tendon. That stretches the quadriceps. Quadriceps stretch then activates the spindle afferents, those 1A afferents. 1A afferents then activate two different targets. First, they'll excite the agonist lower motor neurons, so the quadriceps contracts. The other target of them, number four there, those 1A afferents also excite 1A interneurons. Those 1A interneurons inhibit antagonist lower motor neurons. So we'll see reduced output of the sciatic nerve and thus the hamstrings will relax, allowing for better knee extension. So we get one little bit of sensory input and we get different patterns of motor output. That's the beauty of central pattern generators. One input can create different types of outputs. Of course, we also have inner neurons for the inverse stretch reflex. And these are, of course, from Golgi tendon organs. So if we put a lot of tension on a tendon, we should decrease muscle tone so we don't inadvertently damage the tendon, rip it off the muscle, or whatever. We want to prevent damage to tendons. So, if we have a whole lot of tension there, remember, so contraction without movement, that's shown in the middle there, what's going to happen? Well, those Golgi tendon organs, right, are going to turn on 1B afferents, 1B afferents stimulate 1B interneurons, which inhibit the agonist lower motor neuron, causing a decrease in muscle tone, and thus the muscle relaxes and lengthens. We can see that over here on the recordings in the right. Here they're recording from a lower motor neuron. When they stimulate 1B afferents, you'll notice that the lower motor neuron hyperpolarizes. That is, it becomes inhibited. Now these central pattern generators are wonderful because they let us do nothing well, and they also accommodate uh, or facilitate us doing things. So they help both with inaction and action. Let's consider inaction. I don't want some part of my body to move. Here we're going to pour ourselves a nice mug of soda. All right, so let's walk through this cartoon here. We have our, our elbow at a certain angle and we want to maintain that. So we're not getting any upper motor neuron input. We're not saying move. Whenever we add a little bit of soda to the mug, of course, that's going to add weight. And so the biceps should lengthen a little bit. We should get a bit of stretch. Now, not that much, but the slightest bit of stretch stimulates 1A afferents, which triggers the stretch reflex. And remember, physiologically, the stretch reflex is there to do nothing, not to cause change at a joint. It's to prevent change. So as I start to drift downward, that immediately gets canceled out through the stretch reflex. Those 1A afferents stimulate the agonist lower motor neurons, so I increase muscle tone in the biceps to accommodate the increased load in my mug. So we can do nothing. How nice. One of my favorite things to do. We can also do stuff. What if we have upper motor neuron input? Well, these central pattern generators still help us out. If we want to flex at the knee, that's what we want to do here. We got to do a few things. The first thing we do is trick the stretch reflex. We make it work for us. We activate those gamma lower motor neurons to stimulate the muscle spindles. Right, so step one there, they're turning on gamma lower motor neurons. Step three is where they're stimulating the muscle spindle. Step four is their spindle afferent providing excitatory feedback. Isn't it a wonderful thing? The other thing that the corticospinal tract is going to do right away is stimulate some 1A inner neurons to make sure that antagonist muscle, that is the quadriceps, relaxes. So we stimulate 1A inner neurons that inhibit lower motor neurons innervating the quadriceps. Step two, okay, uh, in addition to tricking or taking advantage of our stretch reflex, we also activate lower motor neurons, of course, through excitatory inner neurons. But those lower motor neurons then cause 
contraction of the hamstrings. That doesn't unload our spindles. No, no, no. We continue to have gamma lower motor neuron output so that the spindle doesn't unload and instead the 1A afferents actually provide additional excitatory feedback to drive flexion at the knee. So central pattern generators help us do nothing, they help us do stuff, and they can act on multiple spinal levels like this right here. Of course the uh, quadriceps is going to be innervated by the femoral nerve and then the uh, hamstrings by the sciatic nerve. Right, so we're looking at some lumbar, some sacral uh, levels there. We can also act on both sides of the body over multiple levels. So here we have the withdrawal reflex. Notice all those black interneurons there. There's my central pattern generator. A little more elaborate than the stretch reflex, which is really just one interneuron, or the inverse stretch reflex, one interneuron. Here we've got a few. We've got to think about those commissural interneurons, because what's happening? Well, step one there, we step on something sharp. That triggers no susceptive afferents that are going to uh, act at multiple roots. You know, there's one primary root, in this case it's going to L5 predominantly, but there's a tract that spreads input over multiple spinal segments. So yes, we're going to excite, we'll say L5, but in reality we're actually going to excite L2 to S2. Remember, your dermatomes are not as clean as we think they are. And then that Lissauer tract spreads it out even further. So, painful input in step one excites a whole bunch of neurons in the dorsal horn in multiple segments. In step two, that dorsal horn interneuron then acts on a number of other interneurons, including commissural interneurons to control uh, the other side of the body those 1A interneurons to allow extensor flexor coupling, right? And so what we should get is activation of ipsilateral flexors, but activation of contralateral extensors. So we're going to do different things on different sides of the body, and it's all through central pattern generators. So what do we get? Step three, we should get the withdrawal of the injured leg, so we should have flexion of the leg that stepped on the, the pin there. As we pull our leg up, of course, we have to bear weight on the contralateral leg, so we want extensors to be activated there. And you don't put a moment's thought to this. You step on something painful, you reflexively withdraw your foot, doing different things on opposite sides of the body. And you don't have to think. The spinal cord does the thinking for you. So the spinal cord does have gray matter. And that gray matter is a collection of interneurons and, of course, motor neurons. Those interneurons can create different patterns of output depending on the input. Is it pain? Is it a little stretch? Is it too much tension at the tendon? Different inputs will give you different outputs. Now, in addition to those conscious motor pathways and all of our central pattern generators, we also have descending non-conscious pathways that help uh, affect motor output. The major non-conscious pathway is the reticulospinal tract. The reticulospinal tracts arise from the reticular formation, which includes both the pons and the medulla. The pontine portion tends to innervate extensor lower motor neurons, while the uh, medullary component tends to innervate more flexor uh, lower motor neurons. And when you think reticulospinal tracts, I want you to think bilateral routine behaviors. Things that you do all the time that involve both sides of the body. For example, walking. This is a wonderful example. So how do the reticulospinal tracts facilitate these routine behaviors? Well, of course, just like the corticospinal tract, they're going to cut down on how much impact stretch reflexes have. Okay, we're going to control the stretch reflex. And here we can see that in these data. Um, on the left, that's just showing you a, a longer time course. So we can look on the right. They're the exact same recordings on the left and the right. It's just they stretch it out over time so it's easier to see. On top, stretch reflex. No input from the reticulospinal tract. Notice on the bottom that little 1A afferent has a little blip, and that leads to contraction of the lower motor neuron that innervates that muscle. 
contraction of the lower motor neuron, geez, excitation of the lower motor neuron that innervates that muscle. I'm a moron. Okay, now down below in part B, still we get that little boop, blip in our 1A afferent, so they stimulate the spindle afferent, but at the same time they also stimulate the reticulospinal tracts, and notice, activity of the lower motor neuron is far reduced. So lower motor neurons become a little less sensitive to the, to the reflexive input and thus are going to respond more so to the descending input. What do they do? They carry out the same old movement that you always do all the time. Here's a wonderful example. This is a decerebrate cat. That means that it's had all the fiber tracks above its brainstem cut off. It has a cortex but it's not connected to anything. They put it on a treadmill and you'll notice it goes from walking to galloping to running. It has no cortex to do this. That motor output is purely driven by reticulospinal tract input and those spinal pattern generators. So they have a treadmill going that gives sensory feedback. We also have the reticulospinal tract to help coordinate those routine bilateral movements. Okay, what's going on? So we have two things, reticulospinal tract and local spinal cord pattern generators. The reticulospinal tract will give you the same old movement. That's its job. Walk like you've always walked. The spinal cord is going to allow sensory input to refine that a little bit so we can walk a little bit differently if the ground is unlevel or maybe we start, we catch our foot on something and we need to adjust our gait to prevent ourselves from falling over. Okay, so in this experiment, what they do, they've got good old decerebrate cats, just like we saw in that movie, and here they're going to stimulate in two sites. They'll stimulate locally in the spinal cord, that's SC stem, or they'll stimulate up there in the brain stem to activate the reticulospinal tracts, that's the MLR stem. Okay, so they're going to stimulate in the medullary lateral reticular formation. Okay, so reticulospinal tracts. Okay. The hind leg is over there on a treadmill. They're going to look at what they call fictive stepping. So uh, the, they're going to make the cat step. All right, and they're going to put the treadmill in different directions, and they're going to see which direction does the cat step when we stimulate reticular spinal tract or spinal cord. Okay, let's take a look. So let's start off on the top here. The cat is oriented in the same direction as the treadmill. So its normal step lines up with the treadmill. Cool. In the middle, when we stimulate the reticulospinal tract, you'll notice it's stepping in the correct orientation. The treadmill is going up and down for us in this illustration, and so my gait is going up and down. So straight, so vertical line, that's where we want it. Stimulate in the spinal cord, that SC stem, up and down. Okay. Sensory uh, feedback from the uh, treadmill lines up with your routine movement. Now what's interesting, they take the cat and they rotate it 90 degrees. So now the treadmill is pushing the limb like this. Now it's got to do a crab walk, right? Sideways walking, not forward walking like it's used to. Stimulate the reticulospinal tract. What do you get? You get the same old direction of movement. I want you to notice it's, it's kind of drawn at an angle. What's going on there? Well, the cat's gait is actually this direction in line with the treadmill, but the treadmill is running this way. So as the cat steps back, the treadmill is also pulling it down, so you get steps in this direction. What this is showing us is that the cat is trying to walk in the same way that it always does. It gives you the good old, well-patterned, routine behavior. Walk like this. It's not a crab. So it doesn't walk this way. Unless we get sensory feedback to make us do so. When they stimulate locally in the spinal cord, so it's not reticulospinal tract input driving this movement, uh, what you'll notice now, vertical lines. So the cat here it is, there's its tail. Instead of walking normally in this direction, now it walks like a crab. It's going to take its 
legs and go from medial to lateral, or lateral to medial for the, for the other leg. So it's going to walk in the direction that the treadmill is moving, not its normal direction. This is all a very long-winded way of saying that the reticulospinal tracts give you well-patterned routine movements. The spinal cord can modify those based on sensory input. And again, we're going to, of course, have commissural interneurons to help control these alternating movements, right? Because all the, cord, all the reticulospinal tract says is walk. Which side is going to go first? It doesn't care. It tells both sides. This is a bilateral tract. Walk. That winner-take-all circuit with commissural interneurons creates burst firing. And there's the recordings of alternating left, right, left, right bursts that you get in the spinal cord. And that allows this cat, without any corticospinal tract input, to walk when the treadmill is moving slowly, to kind of jog or gallop as it speeds up, and then eventually to run. Now I want you to notice that there are some wires there suspending the cat and keeping it upright, that's because it has very little muscle tone now. It doesn't have a cortical spinal tract. So it can't really keep itself upright. There are other non-conscious pathways that we should be at least somewhat aware of. Of course, that raphe spinal tract from the raphe to the spinal cord is important for modulating pain. That's the central gating of pain. Additionally, we have the tectospinal tract, so from the tectum to the spinal cord. The tectum, uh, including the superior and inferior colliculi. This goes down to the cervical lower motor neurons to help us move our head toward the direction of loud sounds or painful input, something like that. So we get this reflexive movement of our head. That's through the tectospinal tract. The rubrospinal tract uh, it goes from the red nucleus down to arm flexors, so upper limb flexors. This is a minor tract in humans. It's uh, been far uh, outshined by the corticospinal tract. But in lower primates, uh, it seems to be more important. You can see the rubrospinal tract in action whenever we have uh, loss of consciousness caused by severe brain damage above the midbrain. That's what we call decorticate posturing. So when we lose the cortical spinal tract, the rubrospinal tract takes over and we get flexor posturing. The rubrospinal tract stimulates upper limb flexors, so you'll see on top there, decorticate posturing involves flexion of the upper limbs. If we have damage below the midbrain, so that the so that the rubrospinal tract is lost. Now we don't have upper limb flexion, instead we get extensor posturing. And that extensor posturing comes from the vestibulospinal tract. The vestibulospinal tract goes from the medulla, so the vestibular nuclei in the medulla, down to lower motor neurons uh, that control the neck, upper limb, trunk, lower limb, particularly important, to keep us upright. That's the job of the vestibulospinal tract. Sense if our center of gravity is moving, and if it is, adjust how we're bearing our weight accordingly. There's two elements to the vestibulospinal tract. The medial vestibulospinal tract controls the neck, so when we bend over, we can keep our head upright. We get this automatic flex, no, extension at the neck. Pretty sure it's extension. When we're flexing at our hip, and this keeps our head upright. You use this if you play pool. The lateral vestibulospinal tract uh, controls more the limbs, so below the neck. Very important here would be the legs, so this helps keep our legs extended and thus helps hold us upright, preventing us from falling down. Of course, we can see its effects in the case of brain damage, so with decerebrate posturing, where we're losing uh, not only the cortex, but also the midbrain there. All we have is the vestibulospinal tracts causing extensor posturing. 
All right, that does it for our descending tracks. If anything's unclear, please fill out the questions box so we can chat about it in class. See you later.